thevolnewpodcast.com. Uh, basically, all Bitcoiners are freedom lovers, and so are all Austrian economics uh, economists. Though I would say that they do differ quite drastically in, in strategy. And um, not necessarily that that is a bad thing. It's just uh, something that I notice is that Austrian economists are much more of, of talkers, right? Philosophizers right. Who, who write books and, and try to uh, share invaluable knowledge, which absolutely is like very, very, very much needed. Without the unbelievable work of Murray or, or Ludwig von Mises, we would never, ever be here uh, standing on these shoulders of giants with all the knowledge that they've created and shared. So no question here. But I would say it's a much more... Well, long-lasting strategy. I mean, Ludwig von Mises was writing 100 years ago, and just now we start to somewhat grasp what he was actually trying to convey. Whereas, contrarily, uh, the cypherpunk philosophy is very much focused on solutions in the here and now, right? So the tools that the cypherpunks of Bitcoin have built are here. And you can use them today to escape coercion uh, and, and to make yourself invulnerable to theft uh, on, on a grand scale. And it works today, right? And so all the theorizing that the Austrian school has laid the theoretical groundwork for will ultimately enable Satoshi and the other cypherpunks to go out and apply what they understand based on the teachings of Rothbard to then build a tool that actually solves the problems of individuals. And I think the two, well, different strategies go hand in hand together. And you cannot emphasize or you cannot really exclude one or the other. You are listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast is covered by BIPCOT's No Government License, allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the pledges thereof. Learn more by visiting BIPCOT.org. So one quick update before I bring in my guest. Uh, we're still releasing new books for Libertarian Type Publications. Uh, the original Vanu book is now back in print. Uh, Self-Liberation Notes went out last week. And Kyle Reardon's uh, important book, Just Below the Surface, A Guide to Security Culture, uh, is up as well. Uh, and uh, there are quite a few audiobooks uh, in the works, too. So just visit libertarianattack.com to check out our selection, uh, or you can find them on Amazon. And uh, obviously, if you're, look if you're an author looking for a publisher or publishing services, uh, we can help with that, too. Just visit libertarianattack.com slash publish. Uh, anyway, on episode 45 of this podcast, back on May 29th of last year, uh, Kyle and I recorded an episode titled Blockchain Technology Uses for Self-Liberators. At that time, I was still a shitcoiner, so it's about time for a Redux version of that episode, and uh, high time for me to say my Hail Marys to the Bitcoin, Bitcoin gods or something like that. Uh, so this 59th episode of the podcast, another in our crypto anarchism series, is titled Bitcoin for Venuans, the Proliferation of Privacy and Security Tools. I'm joined by Max Hillebrand. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, Max is an open source entrepreneur, a Bitcoin enthusiast, a Rothbardian anarchist, a sound money agorist, and a contributor to the World Crypto Network. Uh, but I'd also attached the label of Vanuan to him uh, as well. Uh, so Max, without further ado, welcome to the Vani podcast, sir. It's a pleasure to be uh, speaking with you finally. Uh, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing fantastic, especially here coming to you on the show. Uh, I found you actually through the great episode that you did a couple of weeks ago uh, with Smuggler, uh, who, oh, who nice. I adore for his uh, philosophy of action. And uh, then I was like, oh, this actually sounds really interesting and uh, fell down the rabbit hole of, of Vanuism uh, by listening to all your pots uh, to find out that basically the philosophy that you talk about is something that I've personally lived and and uh, strive to, uh, to align myself uh, or my action my actions to this and so it was uh, quite delightful to see that uh, some have already made uh, these well connections on how to live a freer life and to see your uh, unique spin on it has greatly helped me to advance my understanding of the subject uh, so thank you for all the knowledge that you share and i'm really looking forward to to getting into this episode Awesome. Well, yeah, I, I certainly appreciate that, man. That's uh, that's 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 really great to hear. Um, and 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 for a while, I mean, uh, and I've talked about this a little bit, but I kind of marketed Vanu towards the general anarchist community, and and that wasn't uh, um, it wasn't a mistake per se, but I didn't realize uh, the potential, um, I guess, for Vanu within crypto anarchism as well. Um, so when I got in contact with Smuggler, and I kind of you know kind of got my my feet wet in crypto Twitter. 
and came across some really cool people like Cypher Assassin, um, and uh, obviously you and 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 uh, and and, the, and those folks. I mean, Vanu is uh, it's you. You guys are already living Vanu, um, so it just uh, it's it's just kind of another element, a different way to look at it, and maybe uh, maybe uh, some additional strategies and tactics, um, and I guess uh, um, may, may, maybe some different different choices on lifestyles too. So um, yeah, that's 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 really awesome. Yeah, here, for, man. That's, for sure. That's the goal. I mean. Right, the the general strategy here is liberty, right? How, how to live a free life, and there are a thousand one different approaches to this strategy. But I think it's quite interesting to see uh, Rayo talk about uh, in in his books and publications how he's using early forms of cryptography uh, for secure communication. Right, and of course, cryptography, the the skill and the art of hiding knowledge uh, in in plain sight and occulting as uh, valuable information is it, is quite at the heart of of crypto anarchy, of course, because it is such a powerful, powerful concept uh, to simply well exclude others from from attributing actions uh, to you as an individual, and to see how how Rayo's early visions align with what we today know as cypherpunk is, is fantastic. So he was definitely one of the early pioneers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, he was a, a, a quite brilliant, uh, yeah, quite brilliant engineer. And uh, he talked about uh, um, he talked about things like uh, encrypted ham radio nets. Um, which obviously uh, that's not much of much use to us today, but um, anyway, like that that was that was the way that he was thinking, um, and, and that's 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 what Vanu is. It's uh, you know living out of sight and out of sight and mind from those who would coerce you, um, and obviously one at one aspect of that is uh, you know the the, the lack of attribution uh, to actions. So um, I think it's uh, it just it just meshes so nicely with uh, you know the entire cypherpunk kind of. Uh, um, you know, um, message. So, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you started at the very beginning and, and, you know, work your way back through, um, the podcast. Um, because, uh, um, I know it's, I know it's a lot of, a uh, lot of hours and Kyle and Kyle and I ramble, ramble on a lot. Um, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, really the, the philosophy is, um, obviously it's, it's, it's very much, you know, just kind of general volunteerism nowadays, but back in the sixties, um, you know, that was uh, kind of a, a, I guess it maybe wasn't a, a new thing, but, um, you know, like the, the ideology hadn't been solidified yet. So the philosophy is definitely important. Um, and then things like, uh, import export and then kind of, uh, um, all those sorts of, uh, facets of Vanu. So, um, I don't know, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm kind of rambling now. <laughs> Well, very good. The, these ramblings are absolutely worth it. And you know, the, the funny thing is that I was uh, reliving or rewatching all these uh, episodes of yours uh, while I was on the road traveling uh, throughout Europe, uh, well, really living a, a Vanu lifestyle at that point and seeing just how, how fascinating it was to to have you put like put the finger exactly on, on the wound and to really point out uh, where the solutions are that this lifestyle has to offer. So that was, that was really nice to experience firsthand what you described in theory. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So I guess let's, let's talk a little more. Uh, well, well, I guess to start, which uh, we, we've kind of already gotten into it a little bit, but um, I guess uh, for for those who may not be familiar with you, who haven't uh, you know uh, seen you on a YouTube live stream or something like that, or or on Twitter, um, why don't you start with a brief introduction? Uh, who are you, and uh, what do you do? So I'd say that I'm first and foremost a, a economist by trade. Uh, that's it's just the study of human action is something that has fascinated me throughout my life, and I've accumulated quite a lot of knowledge uh, in this space, even before I got into Bitcoin, and and that includes, of course, Keynesian bullshit and and mainstream slavery economics, but also then the the beautiful art of praxeology, uh, and and especially Ludwig von Mises was something that I got into quite uh, quite early, I would say. Then hand in hand with that, having this good grasp of sound economic theory, uh, I found Bitcoin and uh, simultaneously I found Rothbard's teachings and that together was like this one-two punch uh, to really show just the, the well, irrefutable reason and logic of, of individual liberty. And uh, so then that together tied me or tied me into this rabbit hole of learning more and more about the economics of Bitcoin and how we can really apply Libra sound money today. Uh, and then not just in the theoretical economical point of view, but where I think I learned the most in the last couple of years was, let's say, the cypherpunk rabbit hole of real technology tools that we have at our disposal today mm -hmm. and that we can build out even more beautifully to apply what we know to be truthful and to live a peaceful life not in the future in some distant uh, utopia but in the here and now and i really appreciate this applied 
uh, philosophy of freedom that that is Bitcoin and cypherpunk. And uh, I try to teach as, as many peers as I can to to raise them and to help them discover these tools to defend themselves. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I like it. I like it. Um, so you, you also mentioned, uh, I, I guess, kind of in passing uh, that you were kind of, uh, you know, uh, living nomadically for a while. Um, and, you know, when, when we were talking and uh, um, you were doing a lot, you did kind of, a, it, it looked like you were doing a present, you know, a talk or a presentation a day just traveling around Europe with the Bitcoin tribe. So um, why don't you talk a little more, a little more about those experiences, uh, uh, kind of uh, about the lifestyle, uh, yeah, what you did. Um, you know, that, that you want to disclose, obviously, and um, <clears throat> kind of uh, um, with how, how, how it felt uh, was extremely freeing and, and kind of talk about that a little bit, if you could. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating, the, qual the quality and the caliber of the peers that are attracted to Bitcoin and to, especially in a bear market where all the price hypers are gone, mm -hmm. uh, just the people that are left really have this conviction of getting shit done and to building liberating tools today so that we can use them. And so collaborating with these peers is, it's, it's really, you, you cannot describe it. Uh, it's, it's this extreme urge of, of motivation and this this thrive of well, getting stuff done and to have this for a prolonged period of time is unbelievably productive so i, I like to call these events tribe gatherings because it feels that we as the individual peers of the bitcoin tribe every now and then come together at a different location at a different time with different peers making up that tribe gathering but this, it's all for the same spirit. It's, it's all to build out the system and to provide better tools. So this really is, is fantastic because if you go to several of these tribe gatherings, you will find the, well, in general, the several types of people, but then the same individuals as well. So it really helps to build a very, very strong, solid relationship. Uh, and really in like this separate agora, right? Um, what did Rayo call it? I forgot the specific yeah, name of, of having enclave. like this, well, temporal autonomous, well, yeah, ethical yeah. enclave, exactly. Yep. Th that is exactly, it's really is exactly this. Like you, you meet at some restaurant or you meet at some bar or you meet at some hotel or whatever it is. And you sit there and you build the stuff that you want to build, whatever that is. And having that is is quite fantastic. Uh, so so when we spoke, I, th I think the first time when we chatted, then there was on a on a five week trip uh, throughout the entire world, Europe, uh, to go to different places specifically and only to meet up with Bitcoin peers. So every trip on the journey was a different location where, where other individuals were gathering. And that ended up being, well, probably the, the most productive five weeks of my life, not just mm -hmm. in, in the like real tasks that we fulfilled, but also in the, uh, let's say, uh, spiritual and, and uh, well, in general advancement of, of my mind and understanding of the subject. Uh, so it was, it was quite, quite beautiful and something that I definitely would like to continue uh, focusing and, and dedicating my time on. Sure, sure. So, so a, a thought came to mind uh, when you were talking about that, and and I, th I think I saw on Twitter um, and some of your live streams actually from uh, from uh, I guess from the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. Um, you actually went to Mises University here in the uh, here in the states, correct? Yes, last year, and last that was year. fantastic. That was okay. actually one of the very first uh, video series that I did for the World Crypto Network uh, was coverage of, of that event. And wow, was it fantastic. I mean, it's kind of like the same spirit as a Bitcoin tribe gathering, but it's not focused on Bitcoin, but on economics. So you just have a bunch of same like-minded individuals getting together uh, to hash out the nuances of uh, whatever well, topic to discuss. And the Mises Hue, it is actually happening right now in this week. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot be here uh, this year. But I will definitely try to make it next year. Uh, it's a fantastic event. Right, right. And, and you answered the question I was going to ask. I was going to say, you know, kind of comparing, I guess, compare uh, or, or I guess, uh, yeah, compare the, the environment uh, of Mises University to kind of the Bitcoin tribe gatherings. But, um, but yeah, I, I, it, mm. if you have any other thoughts on that. I have a good question. Um, well, similar in the sense that uh, basically all Bitcoiners are freedom lovers and so are all Austrian economics, uh, economists. Though I would say that they do differ quite drastically in, in strategy. And um, not necessarily that that is a bad thing. It's just uh, something that I notice is that Austrian economists are much more of, of talkers, right? Philosophizers right. Who, who write books and, and try to uh, share invaluable knowledge, which absolutely is like very, very, very much needed. Without the unbelievable work of Murray or, or Ludwig von Mises, we would never, ever be here uh, standing on these shoulders of giants with all the knowledge that they've created and shared. So no question here. 
but I would say it's a much more, well, long lasting strategy. I mean, Ludwig von Mises was writing a hundred years ago and just now we start to somewhat grasp what he was actually trying to convey. Whereas contrarily, uh, the cypherpunk philosophy is very much focused on solutions in the here and now, right? So the tools that the cypherpunks of Bitcoin have built are here. And you can use them today to escape coercion uh, and, and to make yourself invulnerable to theft uh, on, on a grand scale. And it works today, right? And so all the theorizing that the Austrian school has laid the theoretical groundwork for will ultimately enable Satoshi and the other cypherpunks to go out and apply what they understand based on the teachings of Rothbard to then build a tool that actually solves the problems of individuals. And I think the two, well, different strategies go hand in hand together. And you cannot emphasize or you cannot really exclude one or the other. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, so, so I, I received, um, I guess, yeah, the two, two pieces of news I haven't really shared on, on the podcast yet. First off, uh, um, Wally Conger, um, someone who uh, was out at a lot of the, uh, I guess you could call them tribe gatherings in Southern California when, you know, uh, when, when Konkin was out there. Um, when, you know, there are a lot of those kind of dinner parties. Um, he, he sent me like 25 new volume publications to, to digitize. And, and one of them is Innovator, one of the ones that Rayo um, edited. And uh, yeah, even in those, I was surprised because uh, I'm, sh I, I'm sure you've taken a look at, at, at Rayo's, at Rayo's uh, you know, first book. There's not much discussion on economics, right? Um, but like an innovator, there are entire issues dedicated to like the subjective theory of value and such. So even these practitioners, like, uh, you know, like the innovator is like they, they describe it as a trade journal for basically self-liberators. Um, even, even they were spending entire issues um, dedicated to the, to the subject of economics back in the 1960s. So um and I've said this before, too. I mean, you know, theory and practice, uh, you know, uh, philosophy and action, you know, they're, they're a necessary duality. Uh, philosophy influences the actions that we that we take and the strategies that we utilize um, to increase our personal freedom. So, yeah, that's it's they're, they're definitely kind of they're definitely uh, uh, connected 100 uh, percent. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And it's it's based on the trivial process of, of achieving wisdom. Right. First, you accumulate knowledge from a vast eclectic array of sources. And then you internally, for yourself, try to logically understand them and judge them if they are truthful or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third step is action, right? To apply what you know to be truthful and what you really understand deeply to align your thoughts, emotions, and actions. But you cannot do that if you only take in one-sided wrong information, right? If you only listen to Keynesian bullshit, then you can never evolve any further, right? But you need to accumulate truthful information and then Secondly, internally, try to logically understand this. And here's the beauty of praxeology because it is the science of human action. Uh, and, and here's science very purposefully chosen because it is actually provable. And you can actually check all these axioms uh, as human action, right? You, you act, that's the thing. And because you act, we can logically deduce based of that. Uh, so, so praxeology is a very rational and logical uh, study. It's, it's quite important to really understand what we're talking about. But then again, we still have to act out and to manifest this into reality. And here, I would say Cypherpunk really focuses on this last step of truly acting and living free. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. So um, I guess, uh, um, wow, the hell of a discussion so far. Um, but uh, um, is there anything else uh, that, that you'd like to say kind of uh, on the subject we've been, we've, we've been discussing, um, kind of, uh, the, I guess, the, the, the line of thought we've been going down, or uh, are you ready to, to kind of move on to, 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 to uh, some solutions here? Well, I think it's, it's always important to first understand or figure out uh, what problems exist, right? What, what means do you have it at your disposal and, and what is the current situation here? And I mean, just to see that the fiat status quo is, it's appalling, right? It's, it really is disgusting on the level of theft and, and murder and slavery that is going on on such a colossal level uh, throughout several generations now. Uh, so again, that, that is what economics and praxeology can teach us is the immense harm uh, that we are currently doing to ourselves by supporting and, and utilizing this fiat standard of, of aggressive monetary, uh, monetary systems. And well, then understanding the uh, absolute horror that, that we are currently inflicting on ourselves, the question is really what to do. And I, I guess like people like Ron Paul, for example, although like he understands the problem, right? But then he proposes the solution of, of political action, right? And I would say that's, that's quite useful, useless, right? You cannot vote yourself into power to then 
destroy power <laughs> that right. doesn't really understand or that doesn't really work like that. So we, if, if we don't want to change the Fed, right, if we don't want to audit the Fed, uh, we also don't want to really obliterate it, right? We don't really want to throw bombs in there and, and to cause this mayhem and chaos uh, and to inflict this harm and suffering. Uh, that, that might be a worthy strategy, right? Uh, but I guess is, it inflicts a lot of harm in the short term. And I, I, I would say we have our fair share of suffering already. Right. Then the... I would say a logical or another uh, good solution, and that is the one that, that I would propose, is direct action, right? To withdraw your consent and to simply no longer hold any of the fiat shitcoins, but to hold only free and liberating currencies that do not harm others. Uh, and I would say that this strategy of opting out and of using peaceful systems is a, a perfect fit for, for the one lifestyle. So I would say that the tools that we have here at our disposal with Bitcoin uh, are essential tools uh, for any one Yes, yes, I, I completely agree. And uh, I guess um, uh, and, and a lot of the things we're going to talk about uh, tonight uh, deal directly with privacy and, and some more so with security. But um, since we're, we're kind of talking about the problems that need to be addressed, one of those major problems uh, is, is privacy in Bitcoin, right? Um, and uh, I don't know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a problem that needs, that needs a solution. Thankfully, there, there are some out there now. Um, and one of the, one of the solutions, uh, one that I've, uh, I've actually tested out um, is uh, one that you're uh, you're pr pretty closely involved with, I think. So, um, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Wasabi Wallet and uh, how it works, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, so Wasabi Wallet really is a, is a fascinating, fascinating project that has been in the work for well, three to four years now. It had the name Hidden Wallet before, and the lead developer here is Adam Fiskor, uh, and. Basically, this is a wallet for privacy maximalists. Every single decision made in the design process is tailor-made to fit privacy and to defend the individual user uh, to not share sensitive financial data with everyone. And this is done on several different ways. Um, one of the very important things here is that uh, this is Bitcoin, right? So we want to verify everything ourselves. And so out of the box, if you have a Bitcoin full node running locally on the same device, then Wasabi will connect to this full node and do all the things that it needs to do in order to find out how much money you have locally on your own machine machine, meaning that you don't trust anyone with telling you how much money you have, right? So that is good on the verification side, but you also don't tell anyone how uh, or which addresses you're interested in because previous, so if you do not have a full node, then you have to connect to someone else's full node to ask him how much money you have. Mm -hmm. Now, the previous way of doing this was you send addresses to that other person and you tell that dude, please, every time you see a transaction with this address, ping me and give me that transaction. And now that is called the Bloom filter protocol, where you give a filter of your transactions to that other server. Now, Wasabi switches this model on its head, where they, the central Wasabi server, a coordinator, who cannot steal and who cannot spy on you, uh, he gives you a filter of the block that was just added to the Bitcoin time chain. And the filter of this block uh, can prove to you if a transaction of yours is included in this block, right? If no, well, then you just disregard this block uh, and you don't, well, you ignore it. But if there is a transaction in that block and you find that out with this filter, then you either go to your own full node to download this block and you know it's full verification and that it's full privacy also, or you connect to a random Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer node over Tor. Uh, and you download this entire full block. Now, this is a one-time connection to a random Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer node. And these connections are quite frequent. Uh, actually, every time there is a new block added to the time chain, then these blocks are broadcasted and gossiped throughout the entire Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, so meaning, if you have Wasabi, even if you do not have a full node, on the privacy network level, because we use Tor and these Golom Rice BIP158 block filters, you are as private as running your own full node, which on the network level side is fantastic. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, obviously, I'd, I'd recommend, uh, well, uh, I'd recommend, and I'm working on it myself, uh, running a Bitcoin full node just um, just as a way to help support the network. But, um, but yeah, as, as, as far as privacy, I... 
I don't know. I guess I really hadn't thought of uh, that element too much. I just, yeah, just use wasabi. Um, I guess the, the, I guess how, um, I guess the, the, the privacy and, and how, um, you know, you're connecting to remote nodes and such. Yeah, so I, I would say that there are three main rules in Bitcoin privacy. Uh, the first one is to never reuse addresses. You a, use a address, which is a hash of a public key, only once uh, and always only once and never reuse them across several payments right? because that will help a lot with uh, uh, hiding the total amount of money that you have received. The second rule of Bitcoin privacy is never reuse addresses. Never, ever fucking do that. It's horrible. It's very, 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 very bad. And the third rule is run your own full node. Uh, because if you run your own full node, then you don't tell anyone which addresses you're interested in. And combining just these well, three kind of two no rules, never reuse addresses, never reuse addresses, and run your own full node, you're already pretty damn good. Uh, in, in that context, uh, there's a, a great researcher called Jonas Nick, uh, who's collaborating with Blockstream on, on a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, and his master thesis was on clustering uh, addresses. And he found out in his thesis that uh, a naive user who does address reuse and who uses one of these uh, SPV uh, wallets, give him one address, uh, randomly one address that is used by this one individual, uh, and he can tell you 70% of the total wallet, wallet cluster of that one individual. Uh, with minimum calculations. Uh, so, and in his thesis here, this was the exact uh, conclusion. If you want to defend against this, never reuse addresses and run your own full node. And if you don't do that, or if you do that, then you already protect yourself greatly, although that is by far not enough. Right, right. Okay, very interesting. Very interesting. So, um, so yeah, that alone isn't enough. Uh, that's that's not all Wasabi does. Um, but there's a, uh, um, I guess, a little coin join thing that goes on in the uh, that that goes on in the wallet. I want you to talk about that. Yes, exactly. So, coin join addresses. A, a privacy flaw in Bitcoin that is there in order to reduce a lot of complexity and or and increase the audibility of the Bitcoin uh, uh, state of the ledger uh, of who owns how much. So basically, Bitcoin works with the, the so-called unspent transaction output model. So you have a so-called UTXO, a Bitcoin, right? A, a chunk of money, so to say, a chunk of gold, so to say. And this one chunk has a specific denomination of how much Bitcoin. Uh, so for example, 10 Bitcoin, right? So if you have one UTXO worth 10 Bitcoin, then you can use this, uh, this UTXO as the input of a transaction. I'm basically saying I want to specifically send this one piece of money, this one chunk of Bitcoin, this one UTXO, and I want to send this to another script, to another address, right? Uh, so the input is always one coin, and then the output generates new, uh, now unspent transaction outputs, right? It's the output of a transaction that so far was not spent. And this output, again, is one chunk of Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, it has a specific value, right? Let's say nine Bitcoin, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and this means that we have this transaction graph where we could roughly say that inputs, quote unquote, pay outputs. So we destroy a input and we generate a output, and that output can be spent in the next transaction. And then the, a Bitcoin is just the tip of the chain of digital signatures uh, from the Genesis block to that most recent uh, transaction output. Now, this means though that there is a chain of digital signature, right? There is a clear transaction graph that says exactly which UTXO was consumed and which uh, UTXO was created. Now, there is a, a problem here, of course, with linking the transaction history. So we need to figure out how to obfuscate, quote unquote, which input pays which output. And we do this with this brilliant uh, protocol that was invented by Gregory Maxwell in 2014 called coin joins, meaning we join our coins, quite literally. Uh, in the input part of the transaction, we don't just put one UTXO by one individual. But we put several UTXOs by several individuals, all of them in the same input of the transaction, mm -hmm. meaning that within the same transaction, all of these inputs get, quote unquote, destroyed or consumed. 
And with the output side of the transaction, we again generate a bunch of individual UTXOs that go to the individual uh, users. Uh, so basically, they pay themselves, right? They have one input and they have one output. But they do so in a way where a bunch of individuals collaboratively join their inputs and join their outputs. And that is a coin join. And now because there are in the same transaction a bunch of inputs destroyed and a bunch of inputs created, it becomes much, much, much more difficult to find out, again, quote unquote, which input pays which output. Mm -hmm. So a coin join fundamentally breaks the link of inputs to outputs which breaks the chain of digital signatures, which is the transaction history. Very well. Yeah, very, very well explained. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> very well explained. Um, yeah, I love Wasabi. I, uh, I downloaded it uh, probably uh, a month ago. And uh, for the first week, I, I kind of, uh, you know, sent, te sent some test transactions and uh, got the, um, I guess, the test wallet set up um, but I was trying to uh, to find uh, I was trying to find I, I wasn't sure and maybe this is maybe this is just a silly silly uh, you know question but I wasn't sure how to actually get you know like test coins um, to use in the test net um, so I haven't actually been able to, to do the coin join yet but I've watched uh, I've watched some videos of it and such and it looks awesome but uh, yeah I guess uh, um, yeah, yes. do you have any idea on that uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm a big, 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 big fan of, of Testnet. Uh, let me actually, uh, let, me, uh, let me see. Uh, because there, so there are so-called Testnet uh, faucets. And these faucets give you a free fake Bitcoin, so to say. Uh, and the URL is uh, of a really good one. Testnet-faucet.mempool.co uh, and you can get a bunch of uh, fake Bitcoin here, uh, 0.1 per hour, uh, and, and that should be sufficient uh, to try this out. Uh, and I, I agree that you very much should test stuff on Testnet first to really get comfortable with this cutting-edge cryptography and with these cutting-edge tools. So right. Wasabi supports uh, both mainnet, of course, uh, and also Testnet, as well as the REC test, the regression test, uh, which is a, uh, let's say, local Testnet just for your own. So the testnet, like the real Bitcoin testnet version three is public to everyone and everyone can send transactions uh, as permissionlessly as with Bitcoin, pretty much. Uh, REC test is only for yourself. Uh, so if you want to do fast and local testing as a developer, uh, I would probably suggest te uh, REC test, uh, but I personally only use uh, testnet. Uh, well, anyway, uh, all three of them are supported by Wasabi. Uh, so really make sure that you test a bunch of this stuff before. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, obviously, like with with any um, with any new wallet, and this is just a general and and yeah, not not for you, but just generally, um, yeah. If you if you've got uh, you know ten bitcoins, uh, maybe send just a small test transaction first to make sure you didn't screw something up. Um, clearly. Um, <laughs> oh yes, abs yeah. absolutely. Right, and especially because Wasabi is still a relatively new project, uh, and unfortunately, it still does not have much code review. If you compare it to something like Electrum Wallet, right, this is this behemoth written over the last eight years or so, viewed by hundreds, if not thousands, of people uh, to test uh, and and to verify everything. Right, compared to that, Wasabi is, is like by far not as well uh, reviewed and everything. So, really, really, really be careful. Um, now. The good thing is that so far, I don't know of anyone uh, having lost money with Wasabi, so that is great. Uh, and I also don't know of anyone having a, a critical privacy bug in Wasabi, so that is also really good. Uh, but again, still very, very new and, and be careful and do your own research and don't trust but verify. Right, exactly, exactly. So, um, so Wasabi is uh, primarily a desktop wallet, correct? Um, is, are there any plans for, uh, for a, a mobile version? Uh, yes, it is a, a desktop version uh, working cross-platform on Linux, of course, on Mac and on Windows. It, well, you know, we we have to make a bunch of, of shortcuts and, and trade-offs, but we are absolutely not willing to give any ground in terms of privacy. So if there is a feature that would be awesome to have, but that compromises in any shape or form, user privacy, then it will not be implemented in Wasabi. And that is especially the reason why so far we unfortunately see just no way of getting a Wasabi Android version because it does by far not hit all the privacy concerns that we have. And Wasabi is rather heavy software. Um, as I said, it, it has 
not just one Tor connection, but it has several of them uh, to different people and to different peers and nodes and servers. Uh, so that alone, just the Tor bo- uh, was a huge bottleneck to scaling Wasabi, uh, to have a stable Tor connection so far that now we've implemented our own Tor implementation in the end Bitcoin library written in C Sharp uh, that now helped with, with these large scale coordination efforts. Um, there's also, of course, Wasabi is uh, this uh, block filters, right? So you download all these filters and they consume a bit of bandwidth, but especially verification, uh, c- computational power. Uh, so currently, if we would have all that with Wasabi uh, on, on mobile, well, the Tor connection would probably break every couple seconds revealing your IP and it will drain your battery faster than you, than you could probably do one coin join route. Right. So having a full, secure, and especially private full wallet on your phone is going to be very, very difficult. Um, we hope that we can make it, but it's not on the close roadmap because we can still improve the privacy of a good desktop wallet uh, so, 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 so much uh, before we ever see real opportunity of having a similar level of privacy on mobile, unfortunately. Right, right, um, and that that's kind of uh, that's that's kind of kind of what I figured, um, you know, because it's <clears throat> uh, phones are uh, absolutely the worst things for for worst, worst things for security and privacy. So I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine a pr- putting a privacy wallet on there um, would be would be the safest thing to do. Um, but anyway, there, there's another project out there um, that's fo- focusing primarily on mobile wallets. Uh, it's called the the Samurai Wallet. Um, uh, do you know anything about that uh, that you could share with the listeners? Yeah, so Samurai is is also a rather long-standing implementation uh, of a Bitcoin wallet, uh, and they do not have a desktop wallet. They really only have Android, and I don't even think that they have uh, iOS uh, because, well, the gatekeepers of, of the shitty Apple system, of course, not letting them in, uh, no question here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, again, that, that that really is... like. So it's it's not a Bitcoin full note, right? It is not all the full verification locally on the phone. Although, by the way, you can do this with the AB Core application, um, and you can actually connect that to Samurai. So, but what Samurai does is that it it connects to another node for verification. Now, in the early implementation of Sam, the early implementation of of Samurai was that you connected to their server, right? So not a random server on the internet, but specifically to the developer server. Now, you know, always when, when developing, you somewhat have to trust these developers, right? Because they could introduce malicious code. So there's an inherent trust in your developers. Um, but you had some extra trust by also requiring them to not tell anyone about your transaction because they knew exactly how much money you have, when and where, right? Um, so assuming that these peers uh, are, are uh, not malicious and that they are not hacked and they do not get subpoenaed by any tyrant state, uh, then this threat model might be acceptable to you. Right, but uh, again, it's I'm, I'm kind of not really comfortable with this. I really always want to ha- verify these transactions on my own. Now, as I already teased earlier, is that you can connect your Samurai wallet to your own node, and especially just recently, they had this great uh, open source. Uh, well, they open source their backend called Dojo, and you can now run that Dojo backend on your own hardware on your own full node. So. This now allows you to connect your Samurai mobile wallet to your own local full node. Nice. Meaning you don't tell anyone about your addresses. And that is a major, 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 major improvement. Because again, like the, at least this solves the network level uh, attacks or some of them. Uh, and it reduces the, the trust level in, in the developers and their backend uh, greatly. So, so in that, I, I applaud them absolutely for, for getting this out there. Uh, and it's, it's already working for, for several months now on, on the nodal Bitcoin full node and that we might talk about in, in a bit. Um, so, so in that sense, they really are, are doing great work and, and advancing the mobile uh, app experience. But uh, again, like they, they also realize that it's really, really, really difficult to have a full wallet on the phone um, that is privacy compliant. And so they opted for this way uh, to, to have this sev- or the separate home server uh, to then p- uh, or pair your phone with that local home battle station, uh, which I think is a really, really smart approach to do. Right. Right. Um, and, and yeah, sorry for Max and the listeners. My dogs are, my early alert systems are barking. 
Um, so sorry about that if, if, if there's any <laughs> if there's any background noise. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, that that's uh, that's that's all great to hear. I guess the the only downside with uh, Samurai though is that you know Wasabi's free. You got a laptop. You can do coin joints. You can you can use it. But with Samurai it requires. Um, and I, I I think when I looked at it last time it was like four hundred dollars for the uh, for the dojo or something like that. Um, so it, it it requires a you know that capital investment um, for that piece of hardware. Correct. Well, so Samurai partnered up with the Noddle team, uh, a project that I also love and adore and support for several months now. And uh, this is a a, a tailor-made Noddle version that has the Rock 64 board, uh, which is the same form factor as a Raspberry Pi, uh, but it's it's developed by a much more open source orientated uh, Libra community, uh, and it is much, much, much more powerful. Um, so with four gigabytes of RAM, uh, DDR3, it handles the initial block download load and verification uh, from the Genesis block all the way to the block header or uh, to the block or well, the most recent block. It handles that in just two days, which is quite fantastic. And so we've partnered up with Samurai to um, provide a plug and play solution of their Dojo software. But the Dojo's and, and, or well, and this product costs 400 uh, euros or dollars. Why? Because it's actually an expensive computer and it actually has uh, quite a lot of computing power uh, to st uh, to do all your Bitcoin battle station stuff. Um, but the software itself is Libra and open source and you can get it on GitHub uh, and you can compile it yourself, right? And uh, th that, is, that is really, really good. Uh, but yes, the hardware that provides this plug and play solution, uh, which is the Noddle, uh, that, yes, uh, unfortunately costs you a bit, but I think it's an investment absolutely well made. Right. Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I would. I would agree. Um, I should have one of those coming. I thought it would be here by now, um, but uh, um, but yeah, someone was someone a listener reached out and wanted to send me one to, to test out with. So I'll uh, get that eventually. Not sure. Not test. sure when. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, let's 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 uh, let's talk about the uh, the the, the not a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, um, obviously, yeah, we were talking about how it uh, you know implements with uh, with Samurai, um, with Samurai's Dojo, which is uh, really really cool. But um, I guess kind of uh, I'll run through this list and we can we can cover them uh, one at a time. So and this is pulled straight from the website. Uh, but it's a, a Bitcoin full node, a Lightning Network node, um, PGP encrypted backup um, can implement with Wasabi wallets. Um, can be an Electrum personal server. Can do the Samurai Whirlpool, Whirlpool, which is kind of like the Wasabi coin join, as far as I understand it. Um, can be uh, it's cold card secured, which we'll talk about as well. And uh, also Go Tenant communications, which I, which I thought was uh, was was really cool too. Um, so I guess since uh, since cold card is another I guess form of wallet, um, let's talk about that first and uh, kind of uh, how it uh, how it works with uh, Noddle. If uh, you've got any experience with it, yeah. So the Noddle really is something, and uh, it it kind of collects and puts into one box all the Bitcoin projects that I absolutely love. So this is kind of like a hard project of mine. Uh, it's it's absolutely lovely, uh, specifically uh, in regards to cold card. So the rock six so we have a ssd in this box itself uh, that is the fast hard drive right not with the spinning disk that would be the hd uh, but with like the solid state drive and the cool thing is that this board has a power only usb uh, so you can connect your uh, cold card uh, to this power only usb that it just gets just electricity and no data transfer Right? And so you can have the truly air-gapped, um, uh, well, cold storage of your private keys uh, mm -hmm. in this device because it's not connected to a USB with data, right? And the model itself has the SD card slot to which then you can like transfer the partially signed Bitcoin transaction from the model to the cold card for signing and then the signed transaction from cold card back to the model for broadcasting over Tor. Uh, and just because of these two features, uh, the power only USB and the SD card slot, it's tailor made uh, to work flawlessly with cold card. And that's how, how I've been well, signing and, and broadcasting my transaction for quite a bit. That's uh, yeah, that's that that's that's really cool. So um, I guess uh, so. So the cold card, um, it's this this little rectangular device uh, for the listeners and for the viewers on YouTube. You'll see a picture of it in the slideshow. Um, but it's this little square device. It kind of looks like a calculator, honestly. Um, so so it's uh, so it's a basically just a cold storage wallet then, and you can um, basically um, make transactions from it off offline. Um, is that kind of how it works? Yeah. 
Yes, exactly. Uh, it's a offline private key storage and management device, so to say. Uh, it use or it's built by the peers who also built the uh, OpenDime, right? Uh, Rudolfo and Peter uh, from Canada at the CoinKite company. They do an awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, and so basically, it's one hundred percent Libra and open source, both the software and the hardware, and especially the hardware secure module, which is used to store the private keys. That is open source, and that is fantastic because it is one of the very, very, very few open source hardware secure modules that we have. For example, Trezor is absolutely open source, and I love them, they're awesome, but because they must be open source, that was one of their only design poles and foundations, they could not employ a hardware secure module because most of them are closed source crap. Now, Ledger, on the other hand, they wanted to have the hardware secure module, but therefore they had to do it cold, uh, closed source and you don't really know what the fuck is going on on your hardware that stores mm -hmm. your money, which is not up. So cold card, like they managed it because Rodolfo NVK has fantastic connections to hardware suppliers and he's like cypherpunk as fuck and he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so he convinced them of, of giving him a bunch of these uh, hardware secure modules and to open source them. Uh, and that is fantastic and absolutely lovely. So we have really, really secure uh, physical storage. Of course, it's not perfect, nothing is, uh, but it's at least a hardware secure module and it is open source. So that is fantastic. But ColdCard also then uh, uses the latest software. Uh, for example, the partially signed Bitcoin transaction standard, uh, which is a new standard in development for several years now by Andrew Chow of the Bitcoin Core project. Um, and BIP 178 or something, I'm not quite certain. Uh, and this is basically a nice way that a offline signing device can verify absolutely what it is signing. Um, for example, what inputs is it? Where, uh, what position is the key on the HD tree? And then what outputs uh, is it going to? Is this a external send to another wallet? Uh, does it really give me the change back onto my own hardware wallet uh, private keys? And it can do all of these verification steps completely offline and without communicating with the software part uh, that builds this PSPT. And that is what we need with, with cold card, right? Because you cannot have multiple rounds of communication because you would have to import and export the SD card several times. Uh, so this, this way you generate, for example, with Wasabi wallet or with Electrum wallet, uh, this partially signed Bitcoin transaction as a watch only, right? You only specify on the software which inputs to spend and which outputs to generate. Then you put this PSBT onto an SD card. Uh, you put this SD card into cold card. You do all the verifications on this device, uh, powered only to a, uh, to a power only socket, no data transfer. And then if everything is in order, you sign this with the hardware secure module and you export that final transaction over the SD card back into the laptop uh, to then broadcast that transaction to the entire Bitcoin network. Meaning that you never, ever, ever connect your cold card that has your private keys uh, with a bi-directional communication channel uh, to, uh, or for, like, for example, something like uh, uh, USB sticks uh, or USB uh, drives, for example, or cables. And, and that just increases the security and defense greatly. Right. <clears throat> right. I love it. I love it. So I guess uh, um, uh, roughly uh, how much does a uh, cold card cost uh, if, and, and where can people get them if they're interested? Uh, coldcardwallet.com is the website. Uh, they ship out of Canada and uh, starting to have more resellers all over the world. Um, I think, so the Mark 1 was 50 bucks and I think the Mark 2 is 60 or 70 bucks. I'm not quite certain. Uh, I would very much recommend getting Mark 2 uh, because that had a vital upgrade to the keyboard and it's much more user-friendly now with, with a real clicky keyboard, clicky buttons. Uh, and it's like again, this is this is one of these investments that really, really, really is worth it, uh, because well, like it's, I mean, after a lot of testing, I really must say that it is probably the most secure and convenient hardware wallet that we have out there available for for everyone. I mean, you might be able to do an even better setup for you, uh, like individually with with like really really expensive computers, but for anything uh, below a hundred bucks, this is by far. Uh, the the best option uh, I, I I would say um, now this doesn't mean that you should only use cold card right you can have uh, several wallets and you can have multi signatures across several wallets and maybe it's also not too bad to have a couple keys on your hot laptop with something like Wasabi um, diversify uh, not into shit coins but into storage opportunities <laughs> for your UTXOs. 
Right, right. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, so I guess the um, so it's it, they're very so it's a hardware wallet, and at that price, fifty to seventy-five bucks, somewhere within that range, that's definitely comparable to to uh, Ledger and uh, and some of those other ones. So um, that's a reason reasonable reasonable price point, I'd say. So um, another thing that Nautil can do um, is uh, we've talked about the Bitcoin full node and why that's important uh, for for both privacy and security. Um, but uh, I guess the uh, the scaling solution that's been uh, that's been uh, you know developed and worked upon. For for years now by Lightning Labs and uh, and I guess uh, other open source uh, developers, but uh, it's uh, it's the Lightning Network. So um, could you? Um, I, I know on uh, Liberty Attack Radio when I interviewed J.W. Weatherman, he explained the Lightning Network, uh, what the Lightning Network was. But I don't think we've talked about it on uh, this podcast before. And uh, I, there's obviously a lot of confusion with uh, confusion with it. Um, a lot of people don't don't really know what it is yet. It's still, it's still kind of a new technology. So let's let's start there, and then we can talk about uh, how how that works uh, with the Noddle. So uh, what is uh, the Lightning Network? So to to maybe start out with is that. For a regular on-chain Bitcoin transaction, what you do is that you have a UTXO and you provide a valid signature script for this UTXO and you specify a new output script that will lock up the Bitcoin in the future. right? And you broadcast this transaction uh, to the entire network of Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer full nodes who will then verify if the signature is correct if the input is actually a valid coin or if it was spent before uh, and if like the entire transaction formatting is is uh, is, cor is correct and of course if the uh, inputs are larger than the outputs meaning you must not create any new money out of thin air right these are some of the checks that the bitcoin full nodes do for every single transaction that you do uh, on the bitcoin time chain so basically you can say that this is kind of a court of the public peer-to-peer -peer nodes to verify the property rights defined of that Bitcoin. And when making an on-chain transaction, you call upon the entire court of hundreds of thousands of nodes to verify if this is a valid property rights transfer. Now, this is absolutely censorship resistant, as we see, because nobody can stop you doing that. Right, But it is very, very inefficient, uh, meaning that you have to tell everyone that the property rights have transferred. Mm -hmm. Now, Lightning Network is this ingenious way of transferring the ownership rights of a Bitcoin UTXO in a way that it is still censorship resistant and protected against theft, but without telling the rest of the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer nodes that the transaction, the change of property rights of that UTXO have actually changed. And therefore, it is a scaling solution because not for every transfer of Bitcoin, uh, you do not always run to every full node to ask uh, for them for verification, but you do the verification yourself and you... Um, well, you, you only go to the court of public opinion, so to say, uh, if something is not going according to plan, right? If someone is trying to steal from you, only then do you go to the judge uh, and the jury to find out uh, or to like, get your money back, so to say. Um, and that is kind of the, the way that uh, Lightning Network works on a fundamental level. Now, on the technical side, it works with multi-signatures and with time locks. Um, basically saying uh, Alice and Bob have shared ownership over this one UTXO and they change the allocation of that UTXO um, with every update transaction. But they do not publish these update transactions to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network for full verification. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so I, I think w w one of the things that's been touted about the Lightning Network um, is that um, since, um, a as you said, since it, since every transaction that you do isn't recorded on chain, um, then there's nothing to do cryptanalysis on, right? Um, so uh, what are some of the privacy implications with uh, with the Lightning Network, uh, uh, good or bad? And then I guess a follow-up question to that: What about uh, some of the security implication uh, security implications? Um, are there risks of uh, theft of bitcoins on the Lightning Network? work um, um so yeah privacy and security concerns mm -hmm. yeah yeah the, um, and both and it's very interesting to discuss right so for the privacy it's a very different uh strategy compared to coin joins right coin joins say let's put a bunch of information in this one transaction so that we can hide in the crowd right to build anonymity set that is what a coin join does 
Now, Lightning Network has the opposite of approach of not throwing in a bunch of noise, but removing the signal, right? So we no longer have transactions on the time chain. Therefore, they cannot be spied upon, right? And in a sense, this is much more efficient than a coin join, right? Um, but of course, a very different, different approach. Uh, so in that sense, it is fundamentally quite better because we don't have this immutable record where that everyone has verified and seen. Um, there are a couple cool nuances that you can do with your Lightning Network node. Uh, first and foremost, it must be run over Tor. Uh, if you run your Lightning Network node over ClearNet, uh, then you tell everyone, look, this is how much money I have. This is my IP address. If you don't have a VPN, then everyone knows exactly where you live. And pretty soon you will have the $5 wrench attack <laughs> enforced against you. So um, mm -hmm. running Lightning Network or any Bitcoin stuff on ClearNet is a critical bug. And that is very easily fixed by running over Tor. Uh, so that is a must. Um, then also, so with Lightning Network, you have a funding transaction uh, that is on chain. Meaning you have your inputs with a single signature. And you, you burn that input and you generate a output with the two of two multi-signature with Alice and Bob to then open the Lightning Network uh, channel. And this transaction is on the public time chain. Now, the question is, what about the privacy of your input right here? Like, do, do you like use the same input that you just bought your uh, Bitcoin on a KYC exchange uh, and therefore you ruin your privacy? Or is this just the revenue that you earned uh, being an agorist uh, and, and well, providing a valuable service to another individual? Mm -hmm. right? So these are critical long-term UTXOs that you will announce to the public network. So you have to make sure that these UTXOs have anonymity set and you can use a uh, coin join like Wasabi wallet uh, to get that anonymity set for the money that you quote unquote put into your lightning network node. Now, then also the cool thing is that even currently today, when you route a payment across the lightning network, you have several hops across several payment channels between Alice and Bob, between Bob and Charlie, between Charlie and David, between David and Eli. And now by routing this payment, from Alice to Eli, the very cool thing is that even today, Eli does not know who sent him the money. He just knows that all of a sudden he has money and he can spend that money and nobody can stop him spending it. Mm -hmm. But he does, has no clue whatsoever about who has paid him. And that is, of course, a, a huge, huge, huge improvement uh, because, well, Nobody knows where the money came from, which is pretty cool. Right. Uh, and we can further improve that with something called Sphinx routing and rendezvous routing. Um, basically, uh, a technology where we kind of meet in the middle. So neither the sender does not know where the receiver is, and the receiver does not know where the sender is. Uh, so you just send the money to some place, and eventually it will get there, but you have no clue where exactly the payment has ended up. You just know that the payment has arrived. Uh, and, you know, things like these, where we really obfuscate who the sender and receiver is of a payment, is where we fundamentally break the attribution of the payment. And if we don't have attribution, then we don't have enforcement of actions against that action, uh, which uh, is quite fantastic. Right, right. Um, so a couple of questions that came to mind um, while you were talking is, um, so yeah, obviously, um, if 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 all this if all this per, per, personal information is being released on uh, the Lightning Network, if you don't use a, a you know Tor, um, then um, that's that's a problem. Um, so the first question that comes to mind is: um, Are there do you know if there are any I guess Lightning Node um, clients or wallets or whatever whatever the proper software would be um, that come with uh, Tor implementations by default? Because you fucking know, man, um, that if it's not mandatory, <laughs> if it's not just like if it's just not activated people won't do it a lot of people won't do it so um do you know if any 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 come with tor implement implementations by default yeah the default is so 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 important uh, and i absolutely agree it has to be the default for everyone uh, for example right wasabi uh, is per default tor uh, there is not even a question um there are many implementations that do come with that for example on the model it has plug and play tor enabled um, I know that uh, Piero Shard's um, node launcher has now Tor as default as well. Fantastic. Uh, I know the Casa physical node, the Casa physical node, uh, which is a Raspberry Pi, they also have just switched to, uh, to Tor per default. 
And, you know, I actually don't know what happens if you install one of the implementations like uh, LND or C Lightning or Eclair uh, to what they default to. But uh, I'm, I'm certain that they, they have the ability of running over Tor. Uh, but unfortunately, I mean, you can look at this on public Lightning Network explorers unfortunately they still have way too many clear net nodes which is just so stupid i mean yeah it just it just shows that it it wasn't done properly in in the bootstrapping phase right the the default was not tor so everyone was running on clear net uh and and that really i think is is something that well individuals can fix right my node is behind tor uh, but i it's probably going to be a bit difficult to get the masses quote unquote uh onto these these uh technologies and that's why the default is so important Yes, yes. And uh, there's a project that's kind of on a hiatus now that I'm working on called Darklands. And uh, when, when we were having our calls and such and talking about how we're going to build this thing, um, that was that was something I said from, from the very start. It's like privacy is mandatory. Some people are going to be annoyed by it, but we don't give a fuck. Um, they're they're going to have to do that. You know, they're yeah. going to have their it's just going to be mandatory um, because if 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 uh, someone that's using it, security is or privacy and security is bad, it could affect the security of others. So um, not even a choice, not even a choice. Um, and then the the other question I had with uh, with the Lightning Network is, and I've heard some podcasts describe this um, describe this, but I still don't fully understand it. Um, I'm sure some of my listeners don't either. But uh, how does getting in and out of the Lightning ne Lightning Network work? Le network, uh, sorry. How does getting in and out of the Lightning Network work? So basically, um, if you've if you've got your coins that you can send on, you know, the main Bitcoin blockchain, you've got to get them into the into the LN somehow, right? Into the uh, into the Lightning Network. So how does that work? Yes, a very good question. That's something that really takes a bit to to grasp. And uh, I think it's a nice analogy to really start with, with what are the exact transactions being broadcasted to the Bitcoin uh, blockchain or time chain. And here we have the first phase is the funding transaction, meaning that Alice has a Bitcoin UTXO that has, let's say, 10 Bitcoin in there. Right? And she wants to put these 10 Bitcoin into a Lightning Network payment channel. Now, what she does is that she creates a two-of-two multi-signature uh, script with the public key of Alice and of Bob, meaning that it requires both signatures from both Alice and Bob in order to spend that coin again, right? And then she builds a transaction that has the 10 Bitcoin single signature input and that has a 10 Bitcoin two-of-two multi-signature output. Now, she, if she would do that, that would uh, already, then this would mean that she would have to ask Bob for his permission to co-sign the transaction. And since this is her money, right, uh, then she will request Bob uh, first to, to, for Bob to sign a commitment transaction, meaning a transaction where he spends the two of two multi-signature input that is yet to be created on the time chain. Right, but the we we have this off-chain transaction uh, where with Alice's input and the two of two multi-signature that is not yet broadcasted, and already we create and sign the first commitment transaction that spends the two of two multi-signature into a single signature or single public key of Alice of ten Bitcoin again. So now we have the funding transaction, one single signature input and one two of two multi-signature output. And then we have the first commitment transaction where we have uh, two signatures from Alice and from Bob of the two of two multi-signature in the input and a single signature public key from Alice in the output. And now that Alice has already Bob's signature, she knows that at any time she can broadcast that transaction and claim the money that she is now about to lock up into the multi-sig. And because she has this reassurance, now she can publish the funding transaction that has her single input and the two of two multi-signature output. Now that is committed on the time chain and now the channel is opened. Meaning that Alice can now, uh, for example, if she wants to send one Bitcoin to Bob, then she will generate a new commitment transaction. Uh, again, she still has the first commitment transaction in her back pocket. Now she generates the second one uh, where she spends the 10 Bitcoin two of two multi-signature and she generates two UTXO outputs. One is Alice's money of nine Bitcoin, right? And the other one is Bob's one Bitcoin single, sign single signature public key output with one Bitcoin. 
And this is the second commitment transaction, spending the multi-sig, creating now two outputs, one getting paid by Bob. And now Bob will request Alice's signature on this transaction. And when he has this, then he knows that at any time he could publish this transaction onto the time chain to get his one single signature Bitcoin UTXO worth one Bitcoin uh, on some other script, right? He could close that payment channel. Mm -hmm. Or they could continue adding additional commitment transactions that again spend always the exact same two of two multi-signature. But then, for example, in the next transaction, a commitment transaction, it would generate seven Bitcoin for Alice and three Bitcoin for Bob. And then maybe Bob will send one money back and then they will generate a new uh, commitment transaction, spending the two of two multi-signature and creating eight Bitcoin input or, or eight Bitcoin for Alice, two Bitcoin for Bob. And now all these three different commitment transactions are kept locally by these two peers, Alice and Bob, and they are not broadcasted and verified by the Bitcoin network. But hmm. eventually they will want to close this transaction and or this, this payment channel. And closing a payment channel is simply broadcasting the most recent commitment transaction. Uh, for example, let's say it was five and five as the current state of this payment channel. It's well balanced. Then this would be the closing transaction of the two of two multi-signature that generate two UTXOs with each five Bitcoin, but they have the individual public key of one Ellis and the other one Bob. Uh, and this would be the entire life cycle of the Lightning Network payment channel. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I, I guess two two things that came to mind that I wanted to, I wanted to mention because um, you you mentioned uh, Node Launcher um, Pierre Richard's pr uh, project. Um, oh crap! Okay. Yeah, my mic is uh, is is on mute. Just making sure. Um, <clears throat> But uh, um, I wanted to mention that Wasabi is extremely user friendly. Um, it run like it's it's like downloading any program you would on on like a Windows machine. You hit run and it does it for you. There's no command line interface bullshit or anything like that. It's super super easy. Um, and then also with Node Launcher, Peer's project for for uh, setting up a Lightning Network node, um, that was uh, he wrote a very good tutorial on Medium. It's only like three st or yeah, I think it, yeah, it's Medium. Um, it's only like three three or four steps. Um, like you can't you can't screw it up. Um, now the problem. I ran into was um, and and this wasn't really a problem, but I had a few year old laptop laying around. It wasn't a solid state drive. I figured I'd, I'd at least try it. Um, <clears throat> well, I live out in the middle of nowhere and I have satellite internet, so it took like a week and a half to download the entire blockchain. And then once I did that and actually ran, um, you know, ran, you know, actually ran the program, <clears throat> um, it's uh, my that computer is running like a hundred percent for CPU and RAM and all that, and it turned off. So um, just. For just an FYI, solid state drives are important for Bitcoin full nodes. I think at least that's what I've what I've figured out. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that that is at the at the heart of, of the issue of how do you run your full node? What infrastructure do you use? Now, if you have a decent laptop lying around that you do not use any place else and that is powerful enough to run Bitcoin and all the other magic that you want to install, then yeah, that might be a very cool cool uh, solution to your problem because it means that you don't really have any, uh, well, you, you don't have any additional capital costs in order right. to buy, for example, uh, a nodal for 400 bucks. Right. So that is very, very beneficial. But of course, as you say, like this is heavy software. This is not kindergarten. So if you use it, most likely this laptop becomes becomes unusable for anything else right. and it will run 24 seven. And if it's a laptop, then it's going to maybe have a loud fan and it's going to be hot uh, and that might not be optimal. Right. So that, that is why I'm a big fan of having these dedicated always on 24 seven financial battle stations like the Raspberry Blitz or like the Noddle mm -hmm. uh, or like uh, the Shift Crypto Bitbox. Right. There are many different options here that you could use. Uh, and the cool thing with these is most of them are plug and play. So not a, not a lot of the hassle to really set up is, but especially the Noddle. I mean, for the magic that is actually happening in the background, it's ridiculously easy to handle. And it's the small little computer that has a tiny fan that you optionally can turn off because it's still running at like 30% capacity, it can still do much more. Um, and it, it will consume very little energy. I think it's like three watts or something, so really not much. Um, so it would even be suitable to take with you on a, on a road trip, for example. Uh, that was, I, I that was going to be, um, be one of my questions. Bat. Okay, so so you can actually power a noddle um, like with mobile electricity. Then is what you're saying. 
Yes, that is wow. uh, that is actually the very first time that that I got introduced to the novel was at the uh, Parallelna Police Hackers Congress in 2018 in Prague. Fantastic, fantastic event. I hope you will come to this year. Um, and there, Kato Miner, the creator of this little magic device, had a really like the the box with a huge battery pack and with a iPad and with his mobile 4G hotspot, and you can do it. The wow. thing works flawlessly on battery. Pack. Or G. Um, if you turn down all the gossiping, then it has bandwidth requirements of, let's say, about one gigabyte of, uh, of, of data. So bandwidth is probably the biggest bottleneck. But on the, I think it was 1800 milliampere hour battery pack, it was running for one and a half days uh, for me. So it's pretty dope. Yeah. Okay. That was because I, I looked on their website and all they mentioned, um, like I actually did go and look at this. Um, they say that it uses anywhere from 5 watts during normal operation up to 15 watts during the initial sync. Um, so that's, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of initially, I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not, uh, not great at math like this and figuring it out. So I had a buddy help me and we kind of came to the conclusion that if those were the numbers, it probably wouldn't be feasible, but, um, hell, if you did it, then it's feasible. I like that. Um, I, I definitely like that. So, um, yeah, it, it really is. And, and so the cool thing is that there's, because, I mean, as I said, right, bandwidth is an issue. But the really, really, really cool thing is that it's running the Rock 64 board. And, and a good friend, uh, Grubbles, another Blockstream employee, he's working on the Blockstream satellite. Uh, and he has uh, just optimized the Blocksat software uh, that parses the, like, the data transmitted and received via a satellite. And this software itself is running on a Rock 64 board for him uh, personally. So the very same hardware that is running the Noddle already today uh, can run the Blockstream satellite. Mm -hmm. And with a bit more improvements and efficiency, we can actually get it working alongside with your local full node and Lightning and PTC Pay and all the other magic. Uh, so you can have your Bitcoin full node really completely off the grid with exactly this hardware. And you can receive all the Bitcoin blocks uh, without wasting any of your bandwidth. Uh, and what we also got working um, a couple months ago uh, is full integration with Gotenna. Uh, so you plug in the Gotenna and it will now uh, broadcast uh, uh, transactions that it receives over the uh, mesh network. Uh, so if you are somewhere and you have your mesh network and you want to send transactions without touching the internet, you have several hops in the mesh until the transaction finally reaches the nodal. And then the nodal will broadcast this uh, transaction over the internet, over Tor. Uh, and it's, I mean, that's we're really getting there where Bitcoin doesn't give a fuck about the internet. <laughs> that is, that, that's, that's so, that's so awesome to hear. Um, yeah, really, uh, really, really is. Um, I, cause I, I've thought about that too. And, and actually I was, I was on a radio show a, a month ago, a month ago or so. And some of these constitutionalist patriots, you know, like they, a lot of those folks are militia types and they like to think about, you know, off grid situations and they're like, well, how, how useful would Bitcoin be? And I tried to answer as best as I could, but, um, it sounds like a lot of the elements are already there, uh, which is, is great to hear. Um, I guess the, the question that, that I guess the question I would have for you, if you have any idea, um, since I, I have someone that's, uh, extremely knowledgeable about this stuff. Um, so I think the, um, obviously mining requires a lot of electricity, right? So like the, let's say worst case scenario. And if this really was the scenario, then, um, we'd have more to probably, we'd probably have better things, to, you know, more, more, <clears throat> more prominent things to worry about, um, than whether or not we can send Bitcoin. But, uh, like, let's say it's, you know, like a worldwide grid down, uh, you know, situation. Um, and you know, like electricity is sparse, like how, how the hell are these miners going to be run? How are the, how's the network going to be secure? Um, uh, what, what do you think? Well, I, I guess first advice would be to buy gold and bullets. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and the the second <laughs> the the second statement here would be that um, yes, under these kind of conditions, the attacks really get kind of crazy, and you know the the cool thing is that that still the the final settlement of censorship resistant money is a very valuable service. So I'm quite sure that entrepreneurs will somehow figure out to provide this service despite any odds against them. Sure, uh, yeah. And we currently see that even today. I mean, the Blockstream satellite is actually used by many, many miners simply out of the reason because it's it has less latency than landlines, right? Uh, like information travels faster, like through air at the speed of light than it does uh, through a cable uh, under the sea, right? So many miners actually use the Blockstream satellite today because it's more efficient. Mm. Uh, and 
in that sense, right, they can even become more and more off grid. Like if you if you imagine somewhere deep in the forest, uh, like a, a river with a bunch of energy, and you put in a water. Uh, uh, like a water power station uh, to build that energy here and to mine Bitcoin there locally. You receive all your Bitcoin blocks over satellite. And if you ever find valid proof of work, then you broadcast that over a mesh network or over a radio bounces over the moon or whatever. Right? You, a Bitcoin mine can be uh, not connected to the internet. It just needs to have a communication channel and an efficient communication channel because here every second is literally money. Uh, and therefore you... Like the better the communication, of course, well, the better, but we have different tools available to make sure that uh, we get, well, we can defend ourselves uh, more and more, even in these adversarial situations. Now, are we there already? Uh, probably not. Um, I guess if in such a huge level attack, a Bitcoin might still not be secure enough. Uh, it's, let's see. I mean, we'll, we'll find out soon enough. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think the more the more um, likely uh, scenario isn't like a a worldwide um, sort of thing. Um, I, I doubt it would be doubt, doubt it would be that catastrophic. Um, <clears throat> well, you never know. But uh, so 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 then again, you know, if if there if there's a few countries that you know that are that are somewhat unaffected that have reliable electricity and such, then um, then it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, and but I mean, like over a hundred years of fiat uh, malinvestments and overconsumptions, uh, we're at the peak of the peak of the peak of the bubble. It's not going to be pretty. Yeah. Uh, so Bitcoin is tailor made for exactly that problem, and it's not. It's really going to be ugly, and I I just hope that we have good enough tools uh, to somehow well master the situation. But for sure, it's it's going to be difficult, and uh, we will well hopefully. Uh, get through this quite well. And I actually do think that we had now 10 years or more with Bitcoin and that might be already enough to well, get through the worst of it. But, you know, I like having food at the store <laughs> and socialism is very good at making that impossible. So let's, let's see how good they are at destroying capital and how good we are at defending it. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I certainly agree. Um, so I've got a, a question here from a listener. Um, and yeah, it's kind of, uh, kind of, uh, off subject here. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, that's, I, I'm really happy that, uh, um, I mean, I, I, I knew TX10 was doing some implementations with Bitcoin. Um, I'm really happy. Um, like, there's not a, there's not really, at this point, a demand um, for this sort of stuff. And that's the best time to build, obviously. But um, <clears throat> it's just so awesome to see that people are so forward thinking um, that they, they see, okay, well, if, if this happens, then we probably need an alternative to, um, you know, broadcast Bitcoin transactions than the internet. Uh, I'm really happy there's a lot of progress uh, on that note, too, um, because... Hey, if it can still be valuable in those situations, I mean, um, if it still has utility, then then the value goes up. So, um, so yeah, this uh, this question is from uh, from from Mark Wood. Um, he said, uh, uh, you know, I've been wanting to hear more feedback about the whole opt-in address reuse and blockchain analysis as a decentralized reputation system idea. It has uh, it hasn't gotten hardly any serious peer review. Um, so are, are you familiar with this? And uh, if so, what are your thoughts? So I, I'm not sure exactly, but I, I would interpret this question as, uh, well, how can you, well, I mean, on, on one hand, what you can do is that you, well, Bitcoin uses digital signatures in order to transfer the property rights of a UTXO. Now, you can also use digital signatures uh, that still prove that you have knowledge of the private key without revealing it, right? That is a digital signature, but you can do it in a way that it does not lead to a transfer of ownership right of the Bitcoin. Um, basically, well, a Bitcoin transaction uh, is the inputs and the outputs and the signature signs the, like, the bits and bytes, the text message itself of the inputs and outputs. So if you just uh, make the, the message that is being signed still include that UTXO and, but add additional information so that this signature is not a valid transaction signature. So in this way, you can still prove that you theoretically could spend that money um, if you would sign the right message, but you did not sign the right message. So therefore, this specific action is not a uh, acknowledgement of, of property rights transfer. Um, you can do that. That really has use cases, but they're somewhat limited. 
uh, because you don't really prove that you have liabilities against these Bitcoin. You just prove knowledge of the private key. And depending on the use case, that really depends. Um, so th that's kind of like the, the checking of reserves, uh, one part of the question. But then for decentralized identity, well, I hear this buzzword around a bunch of times lately, but, you know, honestly, I think we've solved that issue a long time ago in like 1984 or something with pretty good privacy. I mean, PGP works, like you have your long-term identity and you can exclusively prove uh, that you are signing this message or, or that you agree to this message. And like it works. P2P is pretty, pretty damn good. And actually, I, I might as well now uh, read the last uh, couple digits of my P2P key, uh, with, which are 42AZ3Z57. And you find you can also find that on my website, towardsliberty.com slash contact. Um, and well, when we're at it, I might as well uh, give you Adam Fiskor's uh, P2P key, uh, with which he is signing the uh, Wasabi uh, releases, so always check GPG6 on your releases. And so Adam Fiskor's GPG key is C47E075E. Uh, and that full key is on GitHub uh, in the Wasabi wallet repository. Um, so I would say that PGP solves decentralized identities and we can maybe improve it a bit, but I don't think it's that of a compelling issue to solve. Sure, sure. Um, very good. So, <clears throat> I guess um, I, we, we've covered we've covered everything that I've uh, that I've uh, had in my outline, except for for one thing. Uh, um, we can cover that uh, that that briefly. Um, but uh, the uh, BTC pay server. Um, now, I know when uh, Cody Wilson was knocked off some payment platform, I'm pretty sure he got on BTC pay server the next day. So, um, I guess uh, tell us a bit about that. Uh, how, how 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 does it work? Is it is it much like Noddle, where you're basically just uh, um, handling all of your own payments uh how does it work so btc pay server is a payment processor meaning it generates invoices for you and it keeps track of the life cycle of that invoice very generally speaking now the beauty of it first and foremost is that it is self-hosted and absolutely libre open source software uh, written in c sharp uh, with the n bitcoin library uh, quite uh, and it has like a dockerized architecture that that might be interesting um so in in the context of how can you use this basically there are different options of using it you can either use it to deploy your own bitcoin full node um, with literally one command in the command line and you can do this for example on a, a hosted server right so if you are please don't but if you would be on amazon web services you could easily with one command install BTC pay, which then installs Bitcoin D and LND or C lightning or another lightning network implementation. Uh, and then you have your Bitcoin full node to verify your payments and you have BTC pay server to manage the invoices of your shop. And now this, for example, then you could also though use it on something like a noddle, right? The noddle is self hosting your BTC pay server. In this instance, Noddle is not using BTC Pay in order to create and install uh, Bitcoin D and LND because that is already installed. So Noddle uses BTC Pay only as the payment processor to generate invoices and to follow their life cycle until they are paid or not. Now, what can you do with that? Quite a lot. Uh, basically, what type of invoice you create is up to you. If you want to have an online shop, you can do this. If you want to have a donation page, you can do this. If you want to have a fundraiser, you can do this. If you want to have a mobile point of sale for your local cafe or restaurant, you can do this as well. Uh, so there are a bunch of different modules that you can select uh, that then display the products that you have to offer. Um, for example, just recently, a couple days ago, uh, the Tor project launched a donation campaign uh, for one Bitcoin and they did it with BTC Pay Server. Uh, so mm. they had this, um, I guess, Bitcoin for core, for Tor dot torproject.org or something is the URL. Uh, and this is a self-hosted BTC Pay Server uh, where, you can spe uh, where you can select, okay, I want to donate uh, 10,000 Satoshis uh, to this project. Then you type in 10,000 uh, or you select one of the many perks, uh, like for, I don't know, five bucks worth, you get a t-shirt, I don't know, or a sticker or whatever. Um, and then you 
you type in how much and you press generate invoice and then it will give you uh, the label and for example a bitcoin address if you want to pay it on chain or a lightning network invoice if you want to use lightning network payment channels for these payments uh, and then when you don't pay it then in the back end it is registered okay this is an unpaid invoice and maybe you want to delete this after a while or if it's paid it will it will give you like the okay payment received thank you very much and if it's a digital product that you're selling, then it will give you directly the MP3 file or the PDF document or the link or whatever. Um, or if it is a physical good that you're selling, then it can go forward and uh, start the automating, uh, automated shipping uh, of that product with the address details that was specified in the invoice creation oh, wow. um, window. So BTC Pay Server, that's actually, by the way, that's the, like most of the customers of the Noddle, or not most, but many of them, surprisingly many of them, are entrepreneurs uh, self-hosting their entire payment infrastructure. Uh, and that is just so mind-blowing that this, that this cafe in Taiwan has like a, a central bank fin financial battle station in their back office that audits the entire money supply of the currency that they receive and that authoritatively verifies that they actually receive money with the specific transaction and in a way that it cannot be lied to, it cannot be censored. Uh, they also host like their scalable payment solutions of Lightning Network, right? They have their online shop and their uh, beautiful user interface on the iPhone uh, on top at the counter. Uh, and it's it's all run over Tor. It's something that, as you say, with, as Corey did it here, you cannot be thrown out of your own hardware. This is your software and this is your hardware. And when you use it properly, then nobody can fuck with you and you are ultimately invulnerable to coercion. And I'm, that it's, it's just mind blowing to have these tools available in a 400 buck box. That really is, is very ridiculous. Yes, yes. Um, and I need to get set up with uh, BTC, BT, BTC Pay Server. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure exactly what the full functionality of that was, but yeah, it, that's, that's, that sounds, uh, sounds awesome. And especially when I get my, uh, my Noddle all set up and such, then um, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, so I guess um, I don't have anything else here in my outline, and uh, I guess just one note, this is, this is definitely an appropriate time uh, to have this conversation, uh, considering the U.S. Uh, government uh, now, uh, you know, just a couple days ago declared Bitcoin as a national security concern. And uh, now, if, uh, if any of the listeners were uh, wondering uh, whether that was true and, and why, uh, well, I think uh, this conversation that uh, we've had, Max, uh, <laughs> is pretty demonstrative of, uh, of why they, they see it as, uh, as such a concern um, for, 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 for petty time. You know, but uh, but for for individuals for self liberators, <laughs> um, it's uh, it's uh, despite all of the all of the, all of the bullshit and terrible tragedies happening in the world, um, you know there's 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 some, some stuff to be thankful for. <laughs> oh, I, I I think it's so funny, it's so hilarious to see these tyrants very slowly realize that Bitcoin is black market money that they cannot stop. I mean, it's <laughs> it's fantastic. It it really, really is. Like anything, the state, like the state, per definition, is one who censors you, right? One one who aggresses against you and who stops you in the act of of living or expressing yourself fully. And all of a sudden, they realize that this is impossible in Bitcoin. Like it is purely and only in the second realm. Bitcoin has never touched and will never touch the first realm. Yet the state only operates in the first realm and Bitcoin only operates in the second. So it's, it's completely antithesis. It fundamentally, and I think slowly and slowly they start to realize that, oh shit, we just lost our monopoly on, on tyranny of the money supply. And that is the biggest monopoly, the biggest weapon that they had for the last 100 yep. years. And we are taking away from them at such a rapid speed that they have no fucking clue what is going on for, <laughs> for them. So it's going to be very, very interesting to realize uh, what uh, we're... What, what, to, it, it's going to be interesting to see them realize that they have absolutely nothing that they can do to stop us. And that is going to be a joy to behold. Um, but, but, but maybe before, before we cut this out, maybe uh, on some of the f future tech uh, that, that might come up in Bitcoin in the sure. hopefully near future to help with, with privacy. 
Okay, so I think maybe one of the very awesome things that we can can still do today is actually build out the Lightning Network. Uh, I think this this really is a very nice uh, scaling and privacy solution uh, because again, it it takes away the knowledge verified by full notes uh, and and occult something so that you don't have to tell them everything. Right, that is very very good. But there is one development. Uh, currently happening, and it's it's going to be a quite a big improvement to Bitcoin, and that is a change to the signature algorithm. Currently, uh, Bitcoin uses elliptical curve digital signature algorithm (ECDSA), and ECDSA is kind of a hack around a previous um, algorithm to do signatures that was invented by um, this professor Schnorr. And it's called the Schnorr Signature Scheme. Now, Schnorr was very much an asshole, and he put a patent on his uh, math formula because he he claims that he owns numbers and, and math formulas. And therefore, nobody could use this beautiful tool for 30 years. And ultimately, then in 2008, the patent uh, expired, meaning the tyrant would no longer kill you if you think that number in your head. Uh, quite, mm -hmm. uh, quite nice. And so now we are actively working on getting Schnorr signatures into the Bitcoin protocol. Now... What this enables is a bunch of magic because it's a more, well, it's just a more beautiful signature algorithm. But one specific thing that I would want to highlight that is such a fundamental achievement uh, that, that I would claim that gives us, quote unquote, perfect privacy in Bitcoin. And that is something called adapter signatures. And this can be used uh, in a technology then called uh, a coin swap. So it's no longer a coin join where Alice, Bob, and Charlie put all of their inputs together and generate outputs uh, within the same transaction. But a coin swap um, basically means that Alice has the input in the transaction in block 100. And this is just one input with just one signature. And in this one same transaction, it generates one output with one public key and later one signature. And nothing else is shown in this one transaction. It's just one public key and one signature, nothing else. Now, 100 blocks later in block 200, there's again a transaction that has one input with one public key and signature and this output with one, pub, uh, with one public key and later one signature. So on the time chain, what we see or what we assume would be that Alice controls this input and she controls the output, right? Uh, that she like she sends the money to herself, for example, uh, or then that Bob in block two hundred has again one input and he sends it to himself, right? But now with the beauty of Schnorr signatures is what we can do is that we can hide a secret within the public key and the signature because this is powerful cryptographic magic of Schnorr signatures. We can hide secrets within the signature. And this means that we can have a somewhat unbreakable contract where Alice and Bob swap UTXOs, they swap the coins, meaning that Alice has the input in the first transaction, but she quote unquote pays the output in the second transaction. Hmm. And Bob has the input in the second transaction, but he generates the output in the first transaction. And we we do the swap where we assume that Alice pays to herself, but actually Alice pays to herself in another transaction somewhere on the time chain in the very distant future. And it is indistinguishable because of the power of Schnorr signatures. All we see is a public key and a signature. And this means very like fundamentally that we break the assumptions that within one transaction, one input pays the same output in this one mm -hmm. transaction. And therefore, this means that with every single signature transaction, you could potentially or pay one output in one random transaction, not just within the same transaction or within the same block, but in any block in the future or in any block in the past. And with this, like we... And with a bunch of other stuff like more efficient coin joints and uh, more lightning network stuff and, and stuff like state chains or, or other magic, we have so many privacy enhancing tools available already today. And just to think about what we can do with Schnorr signatures in the hopefully near future, it's breathtaking. We really, we fuck chain analysis pretty hard right now.
that's uh, that's that's so awesome to hear, and uh, it's certainly a different outlook than I got from uh, from both Cipher Assassin and Smuggler. Um, but uh, but a anyway, I, I'm I'm right there with you, man. I, I'm looking at all of these uh, um, at all of these projects, uh, you know, gain traction and you know put out uh, you know really really good privacy products uh, and services, and uh, it's 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 great to see. Um, it's 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 really great to see, and uh, yeah, I think we've definitely demonstrated why um, why Bitcoin is a national security concern. Um, with, uh, with, without a doubt, without <laughs> yes. a doubt, uh, they can only steal. It's, it's, yes, it's yes, kind of, yes. kind of what I, kind of what I've said before, you know, the, the coursers can only course you, they can find you. Well, um, they can only steal what they know exists. Um, and as they know that you have it. So, um, it'll, it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully at, at some point in the future, we'll see, uh, you know, a really, really large adoption of, uh, Bitcoin and, uh, all of this privacy stuff is just baked in by default. And, uh, then the collection of taxes, beca taxes becomes, uh, well, um, kind of, uh, kind of difficult, um, to say the least. So, um, <laughs> lots, uh, lots, yes, lots, yes, lots, lots to be is. thankful for, lots to be thankful for and lots to, uh, to, to look forward to, uh, in the future. Uh, Max, any, uh, closing thoughts for the listeners, sir? Well, you know that that, that you mentioned uh, both uh, smuggler and and cy uh, cyber assassin here. They are, in my opinion, by far, by absolutely a lot, a lot far, uh, the best critics of Bitcoin because the arguments that they bring up are absolutely valid. Bitcoin makes this very difficult trade-off of uh, having bad privacy but a very, very good economic verification uh, of the money supply and and of the property right transfers. And this is a very difficult trade-off, right? Because in the early days of, of uh, cyberspace money, for example, Chom's uh, eCash, we had pretty perfect privacy, but absolutely no economic audibility of the money supply and the property rights. And so over the last 30 years, we tried to find the balance of having enough privacy while still being economically sound and verifiable. And Bitcoin, at first glance at least, um, focuses only on economic verifiability, right? Everything is verified by the network uh, and therefore everyone is known by the network. Um, every transaction is. And that is a very difficult, difficult trade-off. And for the privacy maximalists like Smuggler or Frank Brown that do outstanding work and I thank them for all of their many, many, many contributions, um, they are absolutely right by, by pointing out that this is a trade-off uh, in favor of economic soundness and against privacy. Though I would say that pretty much ever since the start of Bitcoin, there was this drive towards more privacy while still retaining the same uh, economic accountability. And I would say that already now we are at a pretty good point. And again, with Schnorr signatures, uh, I would say that we have really best of both worlds. Privacy that is pretty damn good, and I mean pretty damn good, like that it becomes more like there, there are protocols out there where it becomes already possible on chain today uh, to make a payment where the sender does not know the UTXO of the receiver and the receiver does not know to UTXO of the sender. Uh, and there are other awesome privacy preserving tools that we can use. And so I really, really hope that we can convince or no, rather that we can that we can build the tools that show the use of the economic verifiability of Bitcoin together with solid privacy for the individual user. And I do think that when we have these tools, uh, that these very good critics of Bitcoin uh, will, will hopefully come around and see that we can have both uh, of these worlds, although we initially had to focus on the economic verifiability uh, of the money supply. And it's, it's a very difficult trade-off, and uh, I'm very surprised how far we already got and we will continue building it and make sure that uh, we have these tools available to uh, decrease the amount of coercion in our everyday life. Uh, so again, thank you very much here for, for inviting me onto the podcast. It was a delight to talk to you. And I'm very looking forward to the next uh, publications uh, that you put out there because it is very valuable knowledge. So thank you very much. Hey, well, uh, I certainly appreciate it, man. Um, so, Max, uh, where can people find your work uh, if they want to uh, support you and sh shoot you some Bitcoin? Uh, where can they do so? 
so my, my personal website, self-hosted, of course, uh, is towardsliberty.com. There's also a Tor hidden service uh, if you would like uh, to use that. Uh, and that uh, contains a archive of knowledge, both of Bitcoin and Austrian economics uh, and natural law, freedom, philosophy that links to several uh, quality uh, well, sources of information that, that I would like to share. Uh, and it also contains a list of all the uh, videos and educational uh, content that I've produced. Uh, mainly focusing on economics uh, and the philosophy of Bitcoin, but recently more and more about the tools that we have at our disposal. Uh, so there are like 10 or 20 videos about the Noddle, uh, 40 videos about Wasabi, and another 10 or so about Coldcard or BISC, the self-hosted exchange, mm -hmm. um, or well, other cool tools like Lightning and, and uh, BTC Pay and all that. So I... I hope that we can well, teach each other how to use these very powerful tools. And I hope that uh, I can be of service here uh, of, of sharing this knowledge that I've accumulated so far. Uh, and I will hopefully continue doing all that. And again, the, the email address is max at towardsliberty.com. Uh, and the PGP key ends with 42AC3C57. And again, that can be downloaded the full pub key uh, on towardsliberty.com slash contact. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Max, thank you so much for all the work that you do, um, you know, with Wasabi and just and privacy and Bitcoin in general. Um, yeah, like I've said with, I mean, I say this with every one of my guests because they're all doing incredible shit. Um, but, uh, you know, like it's, it's, it's definitely needed. Um, and, you know, if, uh, um, <laughs> we, we've got to have privacy, got to have privacy. So um, it's, uh, it's cer certainly great to see. I appreciate you coming on and uh, we'll certainly be in touch and uh, we'll certainly, uh, you know, when I got my Lightning Network so set up, maybe we can open up a payment channel and do some, uh, you know, collaboration and get you back on the podcast in the future. Oh, yes, absolutely. Maybe maybe then as a little teaser uh, of, of what I do with, with all my Lightning Network uh, channels, uh, because I think it's, it's quite a nice uh, setup. So um, I do what, uh, first of all, we open a private channel, meaning a channel that is not announced to the rest of the Lightning Network uh, peers. So nobody knows that we two are, have this channel. It's just us that we know, that, that know. And on the chain, it's we just see the funding transaction into a random script uh, that is this two of two multisig. So in that way, we open a channel that nobody knows about. Uh, and for example, if I open a channel to you with 1 million Satoshis, uh, then this would be, all this liquidity would be on my side, right? And I could only send out to you, but you could uh, not send back to me. So what we then do is a non-atomic swap where I send you 500,000 Satoshis in this Lightning Network payment channel, and you send me a separate on-chain transaction of 500,000 Satoshis uh, back. Uh. So basically, we exchange money, I give you a bit of the money in that payment channel, and you give me money on the chain regularly, or maybe a gold coin or whatever. Uh, and in that way, then we have a well-balanced channel where we can both send and receive. And so what I usually do is a, a contract of exactly that with the Lightning Network and Node and the PGP pub key is then a PGP signed uh, so that I have like real proof of this long-term channel relationship mm -hmm. as well as a communication channel that is encrypted uh, to you as well. Uh, so because Lightning Network channels are a long-term relationship with your peer, mm -hmm. I, I would suggest having this kind of setup, uh, not just to protect your privacy of not sharing the knowledge of this channel with everyone, but also to have proof of your channel peer that you are engaging in this economic relationship uh, and the consent thereof, together then with the irrefutable proof uh, of P2P6 and uh, the great encryption that they offer as well. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, great to hear, man. Great to hear. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I, I greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. And uh, keep up the great work of, of sharing the invaluable knowledge of how to become invulnerable to coercion. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, and there you have it, guys. Max Hillbrand from the World Crypto Network, which we didn't get a chance to, to talk about, but you can find them on YouTube. I'll put uh, all the show notes. Uh, um, I'll put all the links uh, in the show notes. Uh, I definitely do hope you go try out and use the tools we discussed today. Uh, like I said, Wasabi. And uh, if you've got a, a laptop with a solid state drive or some, something laying around that you could toss a Lightning Network node on, um, Node Launcher is also very user friendly. Uh, you know, just use this stuff, even at, or, you know, or test this stuff out, even if you don't have a, a, a use case for it, even if you don't know anyone to open a payment channel with or something like that. Um, well, you know, we could we could open one up, but um, you know, just test these things out, uh, use them, um, figure out uh, figure out how they work, so that if it ever comes time in the future, in the time in the future where you need to use it, you have to use it, uh, then uh, then it's there, and uh, you uh, aren't hurrying 
you know, in a time of uh, in a time of uh, worries. So um, until next time, let's build the Agora and let's build Second Realms. Thanks, guys. Building the Agora. Here at the Vanu Podcast, we understand the importance of the Agora and recognize the necessity of supporting its traders. This section of the show is called Building the Agora, wherein we highlight great Agora's businesses, podcasts, or otherwise self operational media. First off is Libertarian Attack Publications. If you're looking for strategy guides, Agora's fiction, or other tools to build your freedom, you need to take a look at what we have to offer. Just visit libertarianattack.com and take 10% off your order by using coupon code SELFLIBERATE. We also offer assistance to new authors in navigating the publishing process, from proofreading, editing your manuscript, to Kindle and paperback formatting, all the way to full audiobook production. We can help you with all of it. If that's a service you may be interested in, please visit libertarianattack.com slash public. If you're like me, you may also enjoy starting your mornings off with a book and a delicious cup of coffee. Well, I've got good news for you. Jay Catano has a great business called Anarcho Coffee, and he's giving you a lifetime 10% discount code, LUA10. Head over to anarchocoffee.com and pick up a bag of Volunteers Valhalla, Rothbard Rose, or some merchandise. I personally drink Rothbard Rose most mornings, and it's absolutely delicious. Highly recommend. Again, that is anarchocoffee.com, and use LUA10 to take 10% off your order. I've often complained about the lack of self operational media. Hell, it's why my first podcast radio show focused on solutions and why this podcast exists. If you're sick of hearing libertarians bitch and complain all the time and instead want tools for your self liberation, check out the Liberty Forge podcast hosted by my friends Kyle Turnblazer and Merrick Van Landingham. They cover all sorts of topics, and it's one of these shows I make time to listen to every single week. Check them out at thelibertyforge.com. Recently, I interviewed Dr. Michael Laufer from the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective. We talked about the importance of health when it comes to self-liberation. Well, our newest addition to the Building the Agora segments is Love Java. Our Age of Enlightenment runs on Love Java, the gateway to your health freedom. Have the ultimate superfood elixir anytime, anywhere with Love Java CBD-infused high-performance butter coffee concentrate packs. Liberty begins with N. Start every day with Love Java for breakfast and live free now. Like the Facebook page and check out lovejava.com, that's L-U-V, java.com for more info or you can private message them on facebook for any questions or to place your custom handcrafted order now again that is lovejava.com lastly is the enemy of the state's dank pod stash hosted by nick irwin and david ballantyne they have a really great podcast that i would definitely recommend in addition to a store with some incredible shirt designs you can find their work by visiting thedankpodstash.com again their site is thedankpodstash.com that's all for now. Make sure to check out the show notes for links to all of these great businesses and podcasts. Building Eagle.